This is the motherboard in its anti-static packing and you should carefully remove it. If the motherboard is supplied with an anti-static mat, it should be left under the motherboard until such time it is installed into the case. If an anti-static wrist strap is available, attach it to the case or to an earthing point on the motherboard as shown. Once again, observe static precautions and avoid touching any of the electronics on the motherboard, even when wearing an anti-static wrist strap. Let's take a quick tour of the motherboard so we can identify its features. You should appreciate that this is not an in-depth discussion at this point. Most motherboards can be identified by the name of the manufacturer. In this case, it is AS Rock. Also, you will find that the model number will be printed somewhere on the motherboard. This model is N68VS3FX. This is useful if your intention is to perform an upgrade. This is the ZIF socket where the CPU will be inserted. Not all motherboards will support all types of CPUs. This motherboard will only accept AMD CPUs. Intel CPUs will not work and in fact are physically different. Here there are two DIMM slots where the RAM will be installed. We can see here that they support DDR3 memory. DDR1 and DDR2 are physically different and not compatible with DDR3. We can see here that there is a notch in the RAM and it is in a different position with each DDR RAM. So if you are installing extra RAM, check which type the motherboard is compatible with. You should also be aware that there is a maximum amount of memory that can be installed. This motherboard can support 8GB, so there would be no point in installing two 8GB modules. This socket is called the primary ID port or PATA port, and if you have any PATA devices, this is where they will be connected. Some motherboards support a second IDE port called the secondary IDE port. This motherboard requires a 24-pin motherboard power plug. However, some require only a 20-pin power plug. If in doubt, always check with the manufacturer of the motherboard. This expansion slot is for the PCI devices such as network adapters or specialized sound cards. Next to this is an expansion slot called the PCIe by 16 and mainly used for graphic adapters as these need extra fast access time. Notice that there is an extra piece of plastic at the end which locks the expansion card into place. One very important point here is if you're having to force devices in or out, then there is possibility of some sort of locking mechanism causing the problem. This is the battery that powers the CMOS. Don't worry if some of these abbreviations are new to you, as we shall be returning to each of these in due course. Our intentions here is for you to get used to hearing them. Next to this are the three pins used to discharge the CMOS. On this motherboard, there is an additional power socket for the CPU. This motherboard has a built-on sound card, and this connector can be used if the computer case supports extra sockets normally found on the front panel. If one or more of the devices that are fitted is a SATA device, then it will be fitted here. This motherboard can support up to four SATA devices. Some motherboards have built onboard speakers, some have the speakers built into the case, or you may be supplied with a speaker that will plug into this port. Here we see two USB connectors, and each one can support two USB devices. This is the power connector for the fan found on the heatsink that keeps the CPU cool. The final connector is used for the front panel. All the LEDs and switches that appear on the front of the case are connected here. On the rear of the motherboard we have two PS2 sockets, one for the mouse and one for the keyboard. This motherboard has a built-on video adapter and the monitor will be plugged into this socket. Here we can find another four USB ports and this motherboard has a built-on motherboard network adapter. And finally, these sockets are used for the microphone, speakers and line out. Let's just recap. First we discovered how to find the manufacturer and model of the motherboard. The CPU would be plugged into the ZIF socket. That the RAM would be plugged into the DIMM slots. 
any PATA devices would be plugged into the primary ID port. This motherboard requires 24 pin power plug. Now PCI devices such as network adapters or specialized sound card will be plugged into this slot. Now this slot is a PCIe by 16 and used for graphic adapters. This is the battery that powers the CMOS. Next to this was the three pins used to discharge the CMOS. Here is the 12 volt socket that used to power the CPU. This is where the speaker will be plugged in. If the case has audio connections on the front panel, then they are plugged into this connector. This motherboard can support up to four SATA devices. These are two USB connectors and each one can support two USB devices. This is the power socket for the fan that sits on the heatsink to keep the CPU cool. And this is the connector where all the front panel LEDs, switches, etc. are plugged into. Here on the back of the motherboard we find two PS2 sockets, one for the mouse and the other for the keyboard. Next to this is where we would plug the monitor, four more USB ports, the onboard network adapter and finally the sound sockets. Now this may seem a lot of sockets and ports to remember but they all have something in common. They all have a unique shape which means it's very difficult to plug PATA devices into SATA ports. One other thing, we should not be too concerned right now about what these acronyms mean at this stage. In other words, it is preferable on how to recognize a USB socket than knowing what the acronym means. In the next video, we shall see how to install the CPU and RAM.